just one of the go-to treatments when somebody is having any kind of zong fu type of injuries or uh, zong fu patterns that we want to have a little extra emphasis in that treatment um, to uh, help out that organ pattern um, so we're going to emphasize the middle jowl in this particular discussion so before we get rolling uh brian is there anything you want to add or should we just go right into it i uh, will jump in i i will add that uh i'm going to be uh, working on some restreaming aspects that we're doing just so we can get it streamed live to our youtube channel for future webinars our facebook page uh, multiple platforms so i'm experimenting with some new software so i'll probably have a little bit of a back seat today i might type in a little bit but um but i'll mostly be in the background today Thanks for handling that, Brian. It's, really exciting that yeah. it's exciting that we're having that live broadcast. So thanks for handling that. All right. Well, let's let's jump into the cadaver warning here if we could. Um, so you guys, we are going to have a couple of different uh, cadaver videos just to be able to show some of the dorsal primary primary nerves and and the depth of the Watteau Jaji, the anatomy of the Watteau Jaji points. Uh, so in the future, if somebody is watching this recording, you might happen to be at a coffee shop or something of that nature. You just want to be really mindful of the surroundings. Uh, some people may actually end up seeing these cadaver images, and it can really be quite upsetting to people. So let's be really careful of this, please. I want to make sure that we don't offend anyone, um, but also they are here for you to be able to learn from so you can be able to help your patients. All right, so let's jump right in. Let's go to the next slide, if we would. Let's talk about the definition of the Watteau Jaji points. I believe most of us know that the Watteau Jaji points are 0.5 to 1 soon lateral from the lower border of the spinous process of that particular vertebra. In many texts, you'll see that the Watteau Jaji points stop at T1. I'm not exactly sure why that is. Um, However, we're going to we agree with Dan Bensky and John O'Connor um, in their text, Acupuncture, a comprehensive text that was first written in the 1980s. And they bring the Iwato Jaji points all the way up into C1, which makes a lot of sense because if you have a dorsal rami nerve, which goes all the way up to C1 and all the way down to L5, then you're going to have a Watteau Jaji point and the effect of that Watteau Jaji point is going to be the same. So we extend the Watteau Jaji points all the way up to C1, C1 and all the way down to L5. All right, so I think let's just go right into this video, which is showing the anatomy of the Watteau Jaji points. This will be a cadaver video, and we're going to be cutting the video a little bit short. It's a long video, seven minutes and 46 seconds. It's a great educational tool, but we're going to stop about five minutes in so we can save time for the rest of this presentation. Yeah, right, this, so, this video is on our YouTube channel too. So um, this one you might uh, want to have access. It's really a great resource um, for, for looking at down the road too. Yeah, excellent. So let's go to video one, please. Before getting to the cadaver video, let's take a moment to review the relevant anatomy. The Watteau Jaji points are located 0.5 to 1 sun from the midline on the posterior aspect of the body. For the thoracic region, it is imperative for safety that the 0.5 sun measurement is used, as a greater distance from the midline increases the risk of causing a pneumothorax, especially with deeper perpendicular needling. The Watteau Jaji points are also motor points. Depending on the depth, motor points of different muscles are reached. The most superficial motor points reached are that of the spinalis, which is the most medial of the erector spinae muscle group. The deeper motor points reached are the multifidi, part of the transversospinalis muscle group. This group is frequently referred to as the deep paraspinals. This video specifically examines the Watteau Jaji point at the level of T9, starting with the skin and progressing layer by layer through the subcutaneous fat the lower trapezius, the spinalis thoracis, the deep paraspinals, and ending at the lamina. The video shows the layers in succession and potential safe needling depth for patients. However, we do not advocate deep needling for every condition, and assessment of the points in the patients must be considered for safety and efficacy. In some situations, a more superficial needle insertion is suggested. In other situations, a deeper insertion is desirable. Palpating for excess and deficiency, along with other findings, will inform needle technique and depth. 
At AccuSport Education, we teach proper needling technique and depth for the Watto Jaji points based on clinical efficacy, patient safety, and patient comfort. A thorough understanding of the various layers is vital for proper needling. Let's now look at these layers on a non-chemically treated cadaver specimen. All right, so with a deeper needling of Watto Jarji point at T9, let's look at the layers that we'll be penetrating. Okay, so we've already gone over subcutaneous, there's the skin, subcutaneous fat. Then we have the posterior aspect here at T9. This would be the lower trapezius. This tissue here would be the latissimus dorsi, so we pull that back, retract it back. Then the next tissue that the needle will be going through with the Watteau Jarji will be the erector spinae. So if we take the erector spinae, we retract that back, we go through the erector spinae, the needle would then, with deeper penetration, go into the deep paraspinal muscles, which lie directly on top of the lamina. So the deep needle of Watteau Jarji point, if it did go to the bone, it would go to the lamina. So let's now Let's take these deep paraspinal muscles off so we can show the bone. All right, so continuing with the anatomy of the Watteau Jarji, as we've discussed, we've got the skin, we've got the subcutaneous tissue, we've got the lower trapezius, peeling that away. The latissimus dorsi, we peel that away. The needle of the Watteau Jarji point at T9 is not going to affect the latissimus dorsi, which is moving out of the way so we can see. Now, the deeper layer, we've got the erector spinae. So the needle will be going through the erector spinae as well. We retract that back. Okay, so then now, as we can see, here's the deep paraspinal muscle that covers the lamina, the deep paraspinals. Now, if we retract this back, Track that back. Now, this gray tissue that you can see. Right there, that's going to be the vertebra. So this would be the lamina. So the acupuncture needle would be hitting the lamina with a deep insertion. Yeah. So 0.5 spoon. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so that gives you a nice in-depth look of what's happening with the Watteau Jaji points and the safety of the Watteau Jaji point when you are 0.5 soon away from the lower border of that spinous process. It is protected by that lamina. Now, what we didn't see in that video are going to be the very thin, uh, very thin, it's about as thin as a hair, the dorsal rami. Now, this dorsal rami nerve is a collateral branch that extends posteriorly from the spinal nerve root. The medial aspect of that dorsal rami innervates the tissue of the deep paraspinal muscles and travels all the way up and innervates the skin, all of the Watteau Jaji point region. Now there's a lateral branch of this dorsal rami that then innervates the erector spinae at the outer bladder line. So your back shoe points are motor points of that particular uh, level. And then we have a further lateral branch of that same nerve. It's a collateral branch going to the outer bladder line. So this dorsal primary rami is innervating the tissues of the Watto Jaji, which would be motor points of the deep paraspinal muscles, the inner bladder line, the back shoot points, and then also the outer bladder line. Let's take a look at another cadaver dissection that we've done so that you can appreciate the innervation of the dorsal primary rami at UB 18, 19, and 20. And special note, look at where the innervation site is gonna actually be underneath that longissimus muscle. Uh, Brian, did you wanna say Before, something? Yeah, before the video, maybe just a quick uh, summary. So the, the next one we have, um, what the, the setup for this cadaver video was, is we um, took a lot of time. This, this is a kind of meticulous process to 
kind of open up the layer between the erector spinae and the and the deep paraspinal muscles so that you can start to reflect back the uh, erector spinae. So in before all that process, the, the fascia covers everything. It all looks kind of like one layer. So you have to sort of systematically go and tease it away and make it uh, a, a model basically that you can learn from instead of it being all intertwined. You know, the, the fact that the fascia holds everything together and encompasses everything is, is informative and it gives you information to see how everything's interconnected, but it's a little hard to see the different layers. So that's that's the setup for the uh, the video is, is we did take that time to sort of tease away those individual layers. So you'll see that when you see the video, just a little context for those who haven't done dissection. Mm -hmm. Good. You ready uh, Matt, for that? Uh, yep. Yeah. Let's do it. Video two, please. As we've been discussing in the SMAC program, the Watteau Jaji point, the back shoe points, and also the outer bladder line are innervated by the dorsal primary rami. The medial branch of the dorsal primary rami, which is a stem that comes right off of the spinal nerve root, innervates the tissues of the Watteau Jaji point. Then there's a lateral branch that will then innervate the longissimus muscle. Then there's a lateral branch that then innervates the tissue on the iliocostalis and the outer bladder line. We can use back shoe points when we're treating vertebral fixations in addition to Watteau Jaji points to reinforce a stronger signaling system when we're defixating vertebral fixations. Let's take a look at urinary bladder 18, 19, and 20. Lift the tissue up and take a look here. Here we go, let's take a look here. We can see a lateral branch right here, going right into the longissimus, innervating at urinary bladder 18. Coming right down here, here's another branch, lateral branch, now coming from T10, going right into the longissimus, innervating urinary bladder 19, the longissimus. Back down here, now we've got T11, T11 coming up, innervating right into the longissimus urinary bladder 20. Okay. So I hope you can really be able to appreciate the, the depth of actually when you're needling the, the back shoe points, um, going in a perpendicular needle insertion is something that we teach in the SMAC program so that we can take advantage of as much of that dorsal primary nerve as possible in the innervation, because that innervation is going to be on the underside of that longissimus. We want to get into that longissimus in order to be able to help stimulate the back shoe points, which will also, in addition to, end up stimulating the sympathetic ganglion. So let's go ahead and talk about that actually now. So from that dorsal primary rami, which we were talking about late earlier, was a posterior branch. Let's now talk about the intercostal nerve, which is going to be an anterior branch of that spinal nerve root. So in the thoracic region, obviously, the anterior branch going, becoming an in, uh, intercostal nerve going all the way to the anterior aspect innervates the tissues of that front mu point. So this is the reason why that we find our front mu points and the back shoe points on the same level line is because of that thoracic nerve. Now, if we take a look at the sympathetic ganglion, or if we can go back to that spinal nerve root, so the spinal nerve root then goes into that uh, pre-vertebral. Pre-vertebral is just basically telling you the location of it. So just anterior of the vertebral column, your sympathetic ganglion. Now that sympathetic ganglion then has uh, branches that are going into most of the organs. Now this is what you can see there in your notes as being that yang innervation. So the sympathetic nervous system being more the yang aspect of it and the, uh, uh, the vagus nerve actually being uh, more of the yin aspect of innervating in those organs. So let's take a look at the connections between the dorsal primary nerve, the back shoe point, the front mu point, we can see how it's all the same nerve. And so by stimulating these points, you are affecting the particular organ through the sympathetic ganglion because it's all connected. Classic treatment would be your yin-yang therapy, which is discussed as your front mu and your back shoe point. But if we add the Watteau Jaji points, 
in addition to that we'll be discussing here in just a tick, the Dumai as well, all of that tissue will be used for neural signaling because it's communicating to that particular organ as well. Let's go to the next slide so we can be able to look at a couple different images and help describe this. So on the image to the left, this is a nice view from Clemente's book. As you can see the dorsal primary nerve on that image to the left, the dorsal primary nerve, then you have that the intercostal nerve then going around to the anterior aspect to the front move point. And so you get a really good appreciation of the continuity of this particular nerve and how we can be able to stimulate with a highly conductive stainless steel needle, the acupuncture needle, and to be able to propagate chi and a signal of our intent. Then you can see that sympathetic ganglion also within that image of the left, how it's an extension an anterior extension of that thoracic nerve and the spinal nerve. This image on the right, you can be able to see also where your back shoe points are, your watcho jiaoji, your outer bladder line, and your front move point, traveling along those intercostal nerves between the ribs. All right, so let's now let's talk about why we want to actually include the Dumai with particular cases. So let's go to the next slide. What's really quite interesting to me is that the different branches or the different uh, pathways of the Dumai. So we know actually from school that the Dumai is going to be traveling along the spinous processes, right? But there's also different collateral branches and second branch and third branch of these uh, different pathways for the Dumai. And I found it really quite interesting how, for example, here on the image on the far left, the pathway there is of the third branch of the Dumai. And in the drawings of it, how similar the drawing is to the multifidi form. So the multifidi being a deep paraspinal muscle innervated by the dorsal rami, and how interesting that is, how it looks like it could be multifidi. So when our founding fathers are discovering and looking at the, uh, the Dumai through cadaver dissections, I, I can't help but think that when they were looking at these deep paraspinal muscles and they can see this as being associated as part of the Dumai and not just the points of the Dumai, um, the underneath the spinous processes, but how the Dumai can be able to expand laterally to include the Wato Jaji points, which makes a lot of sense because the supraspinous ligament and the interspinous ligament, which attach from spinous process to spinous process, are innovated by the same nerve, the dorsal rami, that innervates the Wato Jaji points. So it makes sense to be able to add Dumai points two particular areas when you want to be able to have a stronger sensation to that organ dysfunction. When you look at the image on the right, this is your low collateral. Look how the line of the going extending up from the kidneys themselves. That kind of looks like it could be the same type of fiber direction of the semispinalis, which is going to be part of the uh, deep paraspinal muscles innervated by the dorsal rami. So the similarities are really kind of uncanny in my mind. All right, so why don't we now talk about when there's a vertebral fixation. So the next slide, please. The vertebral fixations are commonly found at the same innervating segment of a chronic Zong Fu organ pattern. For example, if somebody is having, let's say, digestive disturbances like GERD or uh, chronic um, any kind of uh, hyperacidity, anything like that that's affecting that middle jowl. It's really quite interesting to find a vertebral fixation in the same level that innervates those particular organs, level with the back shoe point. So what is a vertebral fixation? So just to be able to put it really quite simply, it's going to be where one vertebra will go ahead and tighten on the vertebra above or below. It's a fixation of the facet joints. Normally, vertebrae will go ahead and move interdependently. They have motion. When they get stuck or fixated, they become actually as one unit. So in that particular case, that can cause wear and tear within the deep paraspinal muscles innervated by the dorsal primary rami and also lead to decreased signaling going into the organ systems themselves, especially with chronic vertebral fixations. So a vertebral fixation, it's a stuck area it can decrease 
amount of chi going to the wakujaji points, to the back shoe point, to the front move point, in addition to the organ itself. We want to be able to make sure that we can try to get rid of this fixation and open up the movement of the chi through the dumai. What you'll find with the vertebral fixation with palpation is that one side will end up being excess and the opposite side will end up being deficient. You'll know this through your palpation. By palpating the side of the shortened deep paraspinal muscles that's pulling that vertebra into that locked position, it will feel excess. It will be tight. It'll be really quite tender. Um, it'll have some rigidity to it. And then on the opposite side, when you're palpating the Watajaji point, it becomes more pliable. It's more open. It's more deficient. So in my mind, this actually is going to be predicating a different needle technique. But I've been doing this for close to 25 years, so I've had a really good idea and practice of how to be able to needle these particular vertebral fixations through trial and error and by making patients really quite sore. So what I did learn is that when you're on the deficient side is to needle quite a bit shallower, more of a reinforcing needle technique. And we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. Let's uh, go to the next slide and figure out how to be able to actually derotate or defixate these particular vertebrae. Hey Matt, quick question. Uh, can you touch on the role, if any, of needling into or stimulating the fascia in these needling techniques? That's a question on uh, YouTube. Sure. Which level of the fascia? That's kind of yeah. my first question. <laughs> It's like for like once you get past the skin, you've got your superficial fascia, and then you've got your deep fascia, and then you've got the fascia that's separating each one of these muscle layers. And mm -hmm. because the fascia intertwines into the different muscles themselves, um, I guess I need a little bit more um, understanding of, of the question. Do, can you answer that, Brian? I'm not. Well, yeah, I, I would maybe need a little follow up question on it, but I think just to, to simplify it, uh, Basically, the fascia is going to have the same innervation aspect. So if the needle is even touching the superficial fascia, it's going to have an effect on that. If you're at the Watteau level on the, the medial branch of the, the dorsal rami, if you're at the back shoe point on the lateral branch on the outer back shoe. So it's even just in the superficial fascia, it's going to have an effect um, on that innervation. Now, the musculature is going to start to become taut and ropey and irritated. And that's going to start to become um, part of the, the pattern. Maybe, maybe it starts with the Zong Fu. Maybe the Zong Fu are irritated um, via digestive disturbance or whatever example we're looking at. And then those musculature starts getting ropey and knotty. So I think there's uh, added value in going deeper than the superficial fascia and going into the level of the myofascia, which is still fascia, but also the muscle tissue and uh, affecting the, um, the deep holding patterns in those structures. And of course, if we're needling the dumai, we're needling ligaments, which are fascia. So it's all it's all part of that innervation aspect. Mm -hmm. I think something to note on that fascia is that with research that has come out over this last decade is that they're, they're finding that the fascia itself is a lot more proprioceptively innervated than muscles themselves. And so that's part of what the needle technique, how important that is of lifting and thrusting and rotating and getting the myofascial tissues to wrap around the needle because that really mm -hmm. starts to signal quite a bit. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So just a very, very simple way of assessing and also mobilizing the thoracic vertebrae is when one thumb is going to end up being on the vertebra above and below, you just mobilize in a frontal plane and just see if there's play to the vertebra, does it move or does it stuck? For example, like you're just pressing your thumbs into a brick wall. When it doesn't move and it's stuck, that's going to end up being fixated. That's going to be the side that you're going to have a deep needle on. That will be your excess side. Right, so then on the opposite side, we want to make sure that we're needling more superficial, more of a reinforcing needle technique. And I think we have a video that actually shows this mobilization right now on T8 and T9. Brian, do you want to say anything before we show the video? Yeah, sure. Um, you'll notice that the video is in portrait mode. Um, this video will uh, be up on our um, Instagram page if you want to check it out later. We'll put it up on YouTube too. It's nice to have um, reference for it, but uh, it'll be on our Instagram page for sports medicine acupuncture. So 
you can check that out if you want to watch it later. Of course, it'll be in the recording of this uh, webinar too. All right, so let's have right. that video through, please. This video is assessing for a T8, T9 vertebral fixation. I locate the spinous process of T8, palpating the superior and inferior borders so that my thumb placement is in the middle of the spinous process. Once the location is obtained, I apply the same method to the T9 vertebra. Motion palpation is then applied to the spinous process of these vertebrae in the frontal plane. The same method is applied to the vertebrae in the opposite direction, examining for freedom of motion. A locked sensation or lack of motion indicates a vertebral fixation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Commonly, you'll find vertebral fixations in the sets of two and three. So it's a good idea to needle and also mobilize. And this is what I was discussing earlier, how it's amazing how well this actually helps your Zong Fu treatments. Mm -hmm. All right. So it is very important in my mind, just from, from creating a lot of soreness with patients with needling deep on both sides and how obvious it is that that, that one side is going to end up being deficient. So a lighter needle technique for sure on the deficient side, only a half inch to three quarters of an inch. Um, it can even be shallower than that if you'd like. And then on the excess side, we do want to get it down to the uh, the deep paraspinal muscles, absolutely, because that's going to be the muscle that's really locking on and holding that vertebrae into a locked position. So we want an excess or a reducing needle technique at the Watteau Jaji on the excess side and a reinforcing needle technique on the deficient side. Now, let's discuss needling into the Dumai as well to help to reinforce this treatment. So then the next slide. Yeah, wait a minute, quick, uh, quick thing just to add to that, Matt. Um, the deep side, I think you can see the cursor going through there. Uh, maybe you get Chi not so deep and uh, um, you can always then put the other needles in and that's gonna start to soften that area and then come back maybe just before you, you uh, leave the room and let the needle sit, maybe after you put the last needle in and then go a little deeper because the tissue will relax. So it doesn't have to just barrel in right from the, the start all the way to the deep tissue. Oftentimes it's not an issue, but sometimes you want to do it in stages. So just to have that heads up. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So what you're seeing is uh, from that same cadaver dissection that Brian did with the videos earlier, how uh, this is a lateral view. The erector spine has been taken off and this is the deepest view. Um, I'm not sure if you can see that copper handled acupuncture needle that is going to be just underneath the spinous process. So the needle is going to be inserted into the supraspinous ligament. So we have past the skin, past the subcutaneous tissue, which have been removed from this particular specimen. And then you have the supraspinous ligament, which is attaching the tops of each one of the spinous processes. And then deep to that is your interspinous ligament. That's a large, broad ligament. So my finger there, the pinky, is actually showing the depth of that interspinous ligament. Um, in my mind, this is where you're actually starting to really propagate do my chi is in this interspinous ligament. So once you start using needle technique at this depth, the patient will often feel the sensation either travel up or down the spine. So therefore, in my mind, this is really the depth of the do my or be able to get that do my chi moving. Now, importantly, like I said earlier, is that these ligaments are highly proprioceptive and they're innervated also by that dorsal primary nerve. So it's just another point to be able to increase the signal for um, your Zong organ patterns, Zong for organ patterns. All right. So then what we've talked about really is just needling the Watteau Jaji point, the back shoe point, the front move point, also the Dumai using a vertebral fixation mobilization. Um, this is a really uh, quick and easy way of getting pretty profound results. There's a lot more to this. Um, obviously, it's uh, we have a uh, six days discussing actually how to be able to do all of this coming up module one um, in the sports medicine acupuncture certification program. That's going to be starting in July in San Diego. All right, so this is going to be uh, discussed really quite thoroughly on a number of different aspects of it. In addition to what can help your patient, let's go to the next slide, is examining their posture and seeing where the vertebral fixations usually occur. And it's really quite curious with a lot of patients with organ disharmony is that they'll have spinal bends. 
the spinal bend you can see on this image on the left, um, this particular patient was coming in with middle jaw disharmony, um, lots of different signs and symptoms of acid regurgitation um, and such. And you can see how the um, elevated ilium, and then you've got a spinal bend of that lumbar spine going into the lower to mid thoracic region. That is usually where you'll get a vertebral fixation is where the spinal bend then comes back to the dumine. Now, this is gonna be the posture of this particular patient. This is the initial office visit after the acupuncture treatment, and then also with myofascial release and re-education techniques that we teach um, in this module one, in addition to emphasizing different exercises that, help to, that will help to continue to stimulate your treatment um, and keep mobilizing that spine for the patient to do at home. So these are all things that we're, that we're teaching. Now let's take a look at the next slide. This is before and after the first treatment. So we did the uh, acupuncture treatment as discussed before. I did some myofascial work, had him perform some exercises, and you can see how the elevated ilium from the left before treatment is now neutralized. That helps to straighten up the spine. And you can see that his dew channel is now much, much straighter. So that's going to start taking stress off that middle jowl and on the road to healing for this particular patient. Brian, is there anything that you wanted to say with that? Yeah, just a uh, quick something on this previous slide that both the myofascial and the corrective exercises you notice are movements more in the sagittal plane. So going flexion and extension. So without getting into spinal mechanics, moving in that way will help derotate and uh, take the side bends, soften the side bends in the spine. So you would think, you know, just if you were to look at it without knowing spinal mechanics necessarily, you would think that you would want to have them do a lot of side bending because if it's side bent one way, maybe you could side bend it the other way, which would help, which would, would do something. But um, but this is just another strategy. We get a lot more into it in, in uh, classes, but um, that's why you might notice that it's a, a movement in those different planes to um, balance the spine from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All right, so we have some contact information on the next slide there. If you guys have any questions at all, feel free to reach out to us. Um, and I think, Brian, if that's anything else for you, we can give thanks to the American Acupuncture Council so much yeah, for, for mm -hmm. this. It's really fantastic. Thank you. And make sure that you uh, come on back next week because Sam Collins is going to be back talking about insurance and billing and such. Um, he's a real quite uh, a fun lecturer to listen to. Yeah, Sam's full of energy. Brian, always nice hanging out with you. And thank you very yeah, much, you American too. Acupuncture Council. And mm -hmm. we'll see you again. Bye-bye.